I feel like the saxophone is the soul. Everybody wants to play the snare drum. It's the most sexiest instrument in the band. H-O-T-T! You know how we go. It is what it is. Y'all laughing, but I tell you the truth. We ain't just good. We drum line good. Let me just rewind. Sing to me now! The year 2021 marks the 10th anniversary of this great organization. Any organization dealing with youth development has a greater chance of success when the parents take a hands-on approach with assisting the directors and leaders. Our parents share their experiences. I'm Crystal Gomez. My daughter's name is Selena Gomez. She was a saxophone player and a saxophone section leader. My name is Michelle Tynes. My son is Ian Tynes and he played the saxophone with the All-Stars Band. My name is Dion Smith. My son is Shandon Smith. My name is Sheena Adderley. I am the parent of Jada Adderley. My name is Stan Campbell, and I'm representing Devard Campbell, my son, our son. Um, his father's name is Donald Campbell. So I'm Corrine Sinquee Brown. I'm actually a physician at the Princess Margaret Hospital, and I'm the proud mother of Chelsea Brown who in 2011 would have joined the band as one of the dancers. The All-Star Band was playing at the mall at Marathon. That's when they wore the Androsia. And we were at the mall at the same time. And he got so excited about the, this band playing. Daddy, I want to join. My cousin was in the band at the, at the time, Tevin Richardson. He's part of the, the drums section. So we spoke to him after the performance. And he said, we speak to Mr. Justilian. We went there, within that same day we spoke to him. He said to come by on Saturday. He said, we have another performance next week, but he can come and see if he's really serious about joining the All-Star. Me and my mother took him there, and this was a Saturday afternoon, when they used to practice on Government High Field. And we dropped him off, we sat in the car, because they were still practicing on the field at the time for the new performance that they were about to have. And Mr. Justilian told him to take out his horn, put it under his arm, and had him stand up on the field and watch the band perform repetitively, learning the routines and so forth. We left, we came back, he still was standing in that same position. My mom got concerned saying, he could play, why she didn't, why you don't let him go and play with the band? But what I realized with Mr. J was teaching him, discipline. If you're so serious about being in this band, what I'm doing to you now is not punishment. You're gonna show me how dedicated you are to wanna be a part of this band. 
And I respect him from that day to now. What he did was an awesome job in reference to that. It built character and it made him hungry that, hey, I can see them performing. I want to be in this line. I'm not just here and I came because I could play a horn to join this line. I earned that spot. One of the things that I think we as parents have to do is to recognize that it is not all about academics. That you have to allow the child to be well-rounded and well-rounded and to multitask. And in fact, what was amazing was that, you know, Chelsea was an exceptional student and I ended up using dance as the thing to, to motivate her to concentrate on her schoolwork. And you know, the, the threat that I gave her was, listen, if you don't get straight A's, you can't dance. Oh, that probably was not a good thing because she was able to get the straight A's and still get the dancing done. And I remember when she was doing her BGCSE exams and I said to her that, okay, no dancing, School is important, you have to prioritize. And in the middle of it all, she said to me, Mommy, I have to dance. I need to dance. And I recognized that dance was an outlet for her and an important outlet that helped her to get the balance she needed. There was a lot of camaraderie. So right away you met the section leaders and the section leaders always made sure that you were ready because you know every section has to play their part and they don't want to be called the ones that were very weak. My overall first impression was one of sadness in terms of missed opportunities. We came at a time when they were preparing to go on a trip and there was a parent meeting and at that meeting, Mr. J was um, speaking to the parents about opportunities. And he had, I want to say maybe about nine scholarships in his hand at the time to give, but nobody was able to take them in that year. It was at that point I realized um, that we would have to assist to make sure that that never happened again. And I'm happy to say that over the years, the number of scholarships students were able to take advantage of increased exponentially. When children see that their parents are also interested or and also involved in anything, the value of that thing elevates. So, you know, just dropping your children off and maybe just participating or attending events, that's, just, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. You have to parent and you have your children and then you have other children around you, not just yours. And so I think it's an opportunity. This, this, is, a, this is an amazing program. This is a, a development program. And also too, it has majority males. Uh, and I think that our young men need extra focus, extra help, extra protection for whatever reason. And, um, and I think that I would encourage parents to, to come out, you know, not just buy the tickets, stay behind and lend a helping hand. Well, actually, my daughter was sort of a little shy. So she was not as outspoken, but she loved dancing. And the minute she joined All Star, she automatically became more bold, outspoken. Um, she became more, had she more, had more of a, of a stronger leadership character. Um, and I would say, as she, if you, if I wanted or any parent wanted their child to break out of their, their, their quiet shell, put them in all-star. Gail, between Gail and Ellie, they will rip them into shape. But um, yeah, but it, it was truly, it's truly amazing. It's truly amazing. She is now a leader at a, at a school. She's about to graduate in August in, with honors. Um, and I am very proud to say, um, and it's all because she also had the experience of the All-Star Band and the directors and the leadership. The, senior, the seniors in the All-Star couldn't do everything. And so we decided to form an organization and the leader of uh, the uh, Parents Association at the time was Ms. Um, Charlene Nobol. So we had Charlene Noble who helped with organizing, making sure, you know, you, you did your, did, were you preparing, make sure she was preparing for your BJC. BGCSE, 
SATs, if you wanted to go to college, help you fill out the forms. And so those are the things we did. Um, I'm so grateful for the All Stars because my son went from college to now graduating from university for music. So when some people pay thirty, forty thousand dollars for school fees because of because of that exposure to music, you don't pay that. It takes a team of hardworking, dedicated, and experienced directors to make the Bahamas All-Stars what it is. Here is their story. My name is Yonel Gestillian, director of band of the Bahamas All-Stars. My name is Gail Denise Outen Monker, as you all know. You know, my first love is dance, but I hold the position of the director of flags that was requested by Mr. Yonel Justilian, and I took up the, I would say, the plunge, and now here I am, Miss Flagette. My name is Ricardo McQueen. I am the Sergeant of Arms of the Bahamas All Star Band, and I also assist with the administration duties of the band. Well, my name is Donzel DeVoe. I am former assistant director and band announcer for the Bahamas All-Stars organization. My name is Eliana Deshan Barros Mackey. I'm holding the position of dance majorettes. My name is Luke Kenton Kelly Sr. They know me as Kenny. I am the drum instructor and assistant director of bands for the Bahamas All-Stars. I also trained the drum majors. Kenny called me, um, he wanted me to come over and um, and do a, uh, a band camp. I came over with... Um, uh, Sorry. Warren. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I, the best, no offense, no offense guys, the best drum instructor that I've been under. Notice I said I have been under. <laughs> Yeah, we came over and that was, that was my first year auditioning students. Um, got a, uh, quite a few to come over to Edward Waters. And what the, the quality of the students, yeah, it was something that, that I really wasn't expecting. Um, but those students, they, they take a lot of pride in what they do, what they do. And so they're going to come in with some quality. You know, we've dealt with students, you know, they come in with, you know, playing certain rap, some rap tunes for, you know, an, an audition. Uh, it was nothing like that. They, they had an etude, they had sight reading was on point. Everything was good because they wanted to take advantage. They were humble. They wanted to take advantage. They were appreciative of the opportunity that we were being able to give yeah. them come on over to the United States and be in our band program. And again, just to, to pick it back on uh, some of you guys, uh, like I said before, the Bahamian students were my were a few of the best students that I had in the band. Um, I heard Kervin Ferguson. Kervin was my first student that I had from the Bahamas. And I'll tell you something about him. This man came over with his mom and he was Nike down with everything. Very humble, 
playing this tenor sax. And it was just, it was my second year at uh, EWC and we needed some euphonium players because I only had two. And he kept begging me, Mr. Red and Mr. Red, let me get on, you know, euphonium. I'm like, no, no, you never have any experience. No, we're not gonna do it. No. And he kept bothering me, so I said, okay, what am I gonna lose? So I let him go ahead and do it. And I kid you not, in two weeks, this man mastered that euphonium. And we couldn't believe it. And every student after that, um, who I had, um, I'm like, uh, Darius. Darius, Ramon, uh, D'Angelo, Michael Sands, um, Harrison, all those students, as they came over, they were just like Herbert. And now, you know, that's when I began to realize this is a mentality of the students from the Bahamas. It's not just Curvin's doing it. No, this is, you know, the overall, you know, mentality of all the students. They were very competitive, especially Darius. Darius is very competitive. Him and Michael Sands, I would walk into the band room, they'd be fussing. I'm thinking it's about something crazy, but they're just trying to outplay each other. And it's not <laughs> like they're trying to outplay each other who's louder than who can outplay each other technique wise wow. and that spread throughout the band because people were watching that and so you know the behavior students for me they're you know very competitive and they love doing what they're doing i met gail when i started dancing at three four years old um we have danced and been tutored and under Shirley Levada Hall Bass who exposed us to all areas of dance, drama, artistic directing, lighting. We learned everything through her which started with the students from the Bahamas going to Chicago and the students from Chicago coming over and from there as we got older, the friendships grew and the dancers got married, had children. Um, they also moved to different states, opened their own schools, and then we started doing the cultural exchange, not only through Chicago, but in Tennessee and whatever state that they were in. And so we got to meet a lot of professionals got to dance with a lot of professionals and be influenced and tutored by them, which has been a great experience for us and we've been able to pass on to many events, many kids. So when we say we know a lot of people in terms of Mr. Ted Levy who did tap, Savian Glover, Glover we, we've really literally rub shoulders because a lot of them came through Shirley Hallbats. She has taught us not to see in a single dimension, but to see it in what you would call um, a three dimension. So anytime you look at dance or you see choreography, it is a story that you're telling or things that you're doing through dance. And you have to be able to execute that in a particular way that people would understand what you're doing. So when we look at what we're doing as it relates to Bahamas All Stars and the band, coming from the background in which we came from, and working with Shirley Hallbass to let you know, it was all about building character, um, leadership, mentoring, coaching, training. It was consistency. So even though when you danced, you were expected to teach and that was your platform when it came to training. So what you would have learned, you would always be a, we would say shadow instructor at some point in time, depending on what you were doing and where your strength was. And even if you had weak areas, she insisted you worked on those weak areas. You know, the curiosity, I started going to the practices and, you know, after I saw what it is that they were doing, um, I had the idea to, you know, just incorporate the announcing so that it would be, it would give them the full package. 
And so, you know, I became the band announcer in February of 2011, after the formal switchover. And not too long after that, uh, Mr. J gave me double duty by making me an assistant director and putting me in charge of the trombone and baritone section. And so I actually made my debut internationally and I shared the mic with legends like Joe Bullard, um, Horatio Walker, who are the band announcers for Farm You and Buffoon Cookman. And you know, these were these were the guys that I actually studied when it came to announcing for bands. I think this organization gives them a, a peep, like a peephole into what's to come, especially if they are seeking to go off into the college life and to prepare them for what is to come. Um, I think this band has provided a whole new outlook on bands in general, but primarily for the American colleges and what is to come, what, they, what are they to expect. And I think they are very much prepared when they leave this band and go off to college. When we first started, we used to play on these white cream looking uh, uh, pearl drums, oh my gosh, um, it was, they were hideous, um, that's all we had though, but we made the best of it, um, then we, you know, fun started came coming in, um, I still like to shout out to Cable Bahamas to this day, they bought the first set of high tension snare drums and bass drums that we have today, we still have a couple of them, um, repairs and that, but we still have them, Tell this day, they bought our first set of drums, and um, because of that, the guys at that time, um, they all grew an appreciation for drumming. You know, they, um, I wouldn't say they were lacking talent, the talent was there. Um, they were lack, lacking the knowledge of how to put organized drumming together, how to hold sticks. And they called everything sticks, even the bass drum mallets. Uh, they still tease me to this day when they say mallets. Um, but <laughs> they didn't know the proper terminology of, they would say, go uh, a, a skin, or go to the store, buy a skin. It's not a skin, it's a head. There's a difference, a goat skin and a, a head is two different things. Um, so, you know, the drum head, I, you know, this little knowledge that I would teach them along the way and help them to get where they were now. I mean, the drumming has evolved. I can remember some of the guys not holding the sticks properly. Um, I still teach them today the how to hold sticks in a V. Or it's, you know, it's just, uh, I don't know. It's just, the, it's just change from jigger, jigger, jigger to basic rudiments. If you, I taught basic rudiments, basic rudiments in our cadences, and it makes a difference. That's what it is. When you review the track record, of the directors and you hear you you watch them you when you you know watching them from other organizations and other community involvement church involvement um, then you further investigate to see exactly where what vision they have well, once they share the same vision as myself i think that's that's key and also having that the experience that's needed and the training themselves because we can't train young people if we ourselves are not trained properly and uh, i was fort i'm very fortunate to have a team of directors that I, those qualities I'm looking for, they, they came with the, with that, and they came with the, with, with the willingness to uh, work with kids on a community level. I must say those two gentlemen, Brian Ferguson and Gerard Lafleur, they are like brothers to me. Uh, they are persons who were partly responsible for me wanted, wanting to take this journey, because I remember talking to Gerard uh, after, after you know, the organization came together, um, if he if he if he was willing to uh, continue this 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 journey, and he said you know he encouraged me to move on, let's let's do this. These, these two gentlemen really have a have a big heart. They, they they love the kids, they love what they do, and they just 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 had a passion for music. And we we really miss them, and we we even have a scholarship established in their names. From all the trips that that we we went on, each of them. Uh, each of them are different 
a different set of audience, different performance, different scenery, different occasion, and, and each of them have a unique response from the kids themselves as well as the audience. I think it was great to see that our kids mix with persons from around the world and perform at the same level, in some cases even higher. It brought great joy to my heart to know that our kids are just as good or even better than, than you know, when we compare ourselves with other groups. And that, that's good motivation for the kids and also a good incentive for the pro to keep the program going. And uh, I think that the directors, the kids, and everyone else uh, now believe that, hey, uh, we have something special here, so let's keep it going. My most memorable trip, I, I think, is the Macy's Parade. Just coming down the strip, uh, just coming down the streets, and just watching thousands of uh, folks performing. And you know our kids, they, they love attention. And uh, when, they, when they see the crowd, the, the, the high stepping, the energy level uh, was just spectacular. Especially when we get, got, got to, uh, uh, I think, Herald Square, where they did their featured performance in, in front of the uh, uh, networks there. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was just a, a spectacular show. It, it's just like walking on clouds. My most memorable trip will, would be 2014 for the Macy's Parade in New York City. Um, it would be crazy for anyone that passed through this organization to not have that as their most memorable trip. But hey, you know, we all see things differently. And, you know, for me, I have been the biggest fan of the Macy's Parade for years. When I was a young boy, a young kid, I have been a fan of that parade. And since the band was on a kind of a traveling role, I said, you know what? It's quite possible that because we have that little difference in you know our band culture and style, we may get accepted for the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. And so what I did was I started researching um, the process that bands would have to go through to apply for the parade. And I actually found the application form. So I remember that following Wednesday, I printed it out. And it was so funny that, you know, that's the one day that my printer decided that the ink was going to go bad. And the, almost the entire application came up purple. And I remember, I said, babe, I don't care. We going through with this. I took that purple paper to Mr. J and I said, Jay, listen, I think we should apply for this Macy's parade. I think we could get in. And so I gave him the paper. He looked at it and he said, okay, I'm going to look into this. And he took the paper, I guess he looked over it some more, you know, pondered on it and decided to send in the application. And lo and behold, we got accepted. And when he shared the news with us, you know, I was over ecstatic. Because like I said, I've been a big fan of that parade for many years. And I can remember jumping on the plane to head over to New York, kind of in total disbelief. Because I was like, wait. I am actually going to be a part of the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. And I remember getting there and, you know, the, the excitement around the parade, you know, it was huge because it, it, it's a big deal because they would make you actually rehearse at 2 a.m. the day of the parade just to make sure that everything is on point. And we had to rehearse hitting here out square, getting in, performing and getting out. And it was extremely cold that morning. I'll, I'll, I'll never forget that it was extremely cold that morning and you know we out there at 2 a.m. you know every time you open your mouth the the mist from the cold coming out you know you wrapped up in under four layers of clothing and you know we did that run through and then when the sun came up we hit the strip of New York City and we marched in that parade and you know for me being a junk canoe I'm used to you know going down the boulevard of Bay Street you know Crowd of people on this side, crowd of people on that side, people in the bleachers. But that experience at that Macy's parade took my view of crowd to a different level. Because I kid you not, there was like a thousand people on this side every 10 steps you make. Thousand people on that side. People were in the skyscraper from floor one, going straight up to the 50th floor and just people. I have never seen that much people gathered in on a parade route ever in my life, ever. So being a part of that parade, you know, that really changed my life, that really changed my perspective of parades and events. Because, you know, you, you, you see this thing on TV all of these years, and then you actually get there, and 
you know, you get to experience it for yourself and you get to feel the vibe of the crowd, feel the energy of the crowd, the vibe of the atmosphere. You know, every three steps you make, people shouting from the bleachers, happy Thanksgiving, and there's cameras everywhere. So that for me, that, that, that would be something that I will, I'll never forget, actually being able to take part in something that I have, I had fallen in love with. You know, Mr. Woods and I sat down in the office and we talked for about two hours and I had to convince him. I had to really convince him on to allowing us to come to the Florida Classic. Um, I sat there, I talked to him, I talked to him, I begged and I pleaded with him. I said, listen, this is not the band that came from the Bahamas a couple years ago. And the person said, you know, I shouldn't read out of songbooks. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, um, and I promised him that we would, you know, we needed time to get um, to the classic and how we had to get the way to raise funds, et cetera, et cetera. Went through the whole spill with him. And he finally, you know, by the time I left out of his office, he um, said yes. At this time, we were still playing on them white pearl drums with the one, one head saying pearl, one head saying audio plus. So uh, we still was uh, playing on them at the time. And like I said, Cable Bombers came through for us. Cable Cares, I think, that we have a, and they came through for us with some brand new drums. And we went to Florida Classic. And, you know, I can remember my frat brother, T3, I had to borrow. One of the guys left the tenor drum, well, bass drum slash tenor drum strap in the hotel. So I had to borrow a tenor drum strap from um, my frat brother named T2, that's why. And, you know, when I borrowed it, and, you know, we did our thing, and we did our thing in the classic, my frat brothers came to me, oh man, y'all did, y'all, y'all smashed, y'all sound good, X Y. you know, the whole night, it was, it was just pure congratulatory, congratulatory comments the whole time, you know, so it was just exciting to see them, and coming from them, and it meant a lot because, you know, this little band out of the island coming to the Florida Classic where over 40,000 persons is be in attendance. You know what that is? 40,000 persons to watch you perform. You know, um, then the most, the memorable part is, at the end of the night, you know, um, let me tell you about my frat with the T2. Um, I had to buy it and all along, me and my frat with the Kedrick Redden, um, he and I just going at it the whole time because he was teaching at Jones High at the time. And we just going at it the whole time. Yeah, I'm gonna blow you out. Oh, bring your drum line. Ah, yeah, bring your drum on. Bring your this, bring your that. All right, no problem. All right, keep talking smack, keep talking smack. So we just talking, we talking, talking. I ain't saying nothing to him. Um, so at this time, Florida Classic, they allowed you to play outside and not just inside. So we going outside and we playing, you know, we line up, everybody line up line up, uh, knockout line up, Jones High line up on the other side, click, 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 did it, we played the boys, they played that cadence, that's the best they played that cadence, the whole, we practiced it, they messed up, we, practiced, we went over there, over there. when we got to Florida class, although, although the tempo was a little fast, but you know, um, you know, they played that, that was the best they played that cadence, and once, we was finished. I could. I remember T2 said, "Man, how you gonna borrow my strap to shine on me like that?" <laughs> how you gonna borrow my strap to shine to make my my look bad? But you know, it was all out of fun. You know, just to hear that. That was my most memorable and most. I think that most my most favorable trip because of, um, and because of how we got there, how we performed. And the doors just, the floodgates just started opening up after that for the Bombers All Stars. We brought Mr. Wells down to the FR Spring concert and he came and down and he just opened the floodgates. I think um, Mrs. Dr. Zachary mentioned it the other night on our show that, you know, thanks Mr. Wells for giving us that opportunity, man. You know, if we didn't have the opportunity, a lot of things wouldn't happen, you know. The doors wouldn't open, the floodgates wouldn't, you know, open up. 
when those kids come to me and other band directors and not only they are academically sound but they have been taught well on their instrument you know they've been taught fundamentals they they come in with proper armatures they know what in tune is they know what out of tune is you know uh they have an ear and, and and they can relate to different styles of music a lot of teaching has been going on a lot of teaching that's that's a grind that people don't see that's not popular a lot of teaching when it's nobody but you and the kids in the building and um people are other places doing other things and that takes commitment so the commitment that you all have to those kids and and they realize they realize they always talk about mr j kenny and all all the people down there they realize what you all are doing for them and um i'm gonna tell you it's it's just uh it's refreshing to see people with that kind of commitment you know it's heavy lifting uh and you all are doing it for them you're not doing it for any kind of accolades or awards or anything that lifts you up. Every every word I've heard you say on this conversation and Mr. Justillian has been about those students. And uh, and that's what education is about, man. And uh, I want to commend you all and the staff, man, for, for the work that you're doing, the grind that you have done, the commitment that you have done. And you're doing it unselfishly to help, help others, man. And that's that's hard to find in these days and time. It's hard to find. When the kids got up and they saw snow for the first, first time, time, some of them, it was amazing to see the expressions on their faces and watch them running around and playing with each other. It was a good feeling. It, little simple things like that is just amazing to watch. Because we don't tend to enjoy simple things in life. And so Macy's, for me, it was watching those kids just playing in the snow for the first time, some of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everything becomes a blur. So I might be mixing up trips together. I know one memorable trip was when we spent the whole night in the ER with one of the children. Macy's. That was Macy's? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes, I remember yeah. that. So... It was memorable in that I was angry in the beginning. <laughs> you know, you, I'm like, you know, this this just is not right. But at the end of the day, um, everything was okay. Everything turned out well. well. Um, for Ireland, wow. There was many things. Many, many things in Ireland. It was the whole event of Ireland, I, I, I must that say. The whole experience of being in a European country at the time of the parade. It was special for me too because St. Patrick's Day is my daughter's birthday. birthday yeah. So she got to spend her 21st, was it? No, her 25th, 25th, birthday, birthday. 25th birthday in Ireland. In Ireland on, on her, her birthday. birthday. And so she, she got to see the leprechauns. She had a wonderful time. And I was intricately involved in Ireland. I was pushing Mr. J them to do the European trip. I was even trying to push them to do the European trip before COVID, but they didn't listen to me. Now see, the world come to a stop. We may never get over there again. But anyhow, sleeping that alone, water under the bridge, soon. When? I don't know. But Ireland, Ireland, because it was, we always go to the US. So we always understand the US flavor. And I think the kids needed to get a different type of flavor that European, experience. that different experience all together to let you know that there is something on the other side of the world that you have not seen, that you have not been to. And I think with the mountains in Ireland and looking at the ocean and I mean, just seeing the different experience and, and the greenery, uh, it was just breathtaking. It, it, was, it was wonderful big buses that you would have to travel on on the small roads the good um the evenings were good also because when the, the kids went to bed yeah would get together and we just had a good, good time. time and i didn't think the parents ever saw that side of us no. the fun side um and for the first time they saw the relaxed side of kale and ellie the true relaxed side and I think once they saw the relaxed side. Remember Sheena got up and danced and 
Oh yeah. Like replays and stuff. The parents in the evening. Right. So we, we had a really good, good time. time. It was good. And the hotels were beautiful. beautiful. All five star hotels we stayed in. All In its 10 years of existence, the Bahamas All-Stars has produced an accomplished group of alumni. Let's hear from them. My name is Kalano Bain, an alum of the All-Star Band, trombone section. Hi, my name is Kosia King, and I'm a part of the flagged section. My name is Rashawn Cunningham, and I'm an All-Star. I first was in the tuba section, also known as TNT. I was the section here for that section. My name is Rakesha Hamilton and I'm a part of the saxophone section. I play alto saxophone. My name is Nathaniel Adams and I was a part of the drum major section. My first time hearing All Stars. It was when my brother joined the band in junior school and we would normally support him, go to the performances and support him, and we would sit there. I remember this one time, it was at the gymnasium, where the lights were dim, flashing lights and star all over the start, all over the, the floors and everything like that. There was smoke coming out of nowhere, and the band just came, came in and all sides, the four corners, walking slowly and playing the instruments. And I was like, wow. I was literally shaking. I was like, wow, I want to be a part of this band. And I saw the flaggets in front doing their feature and everything like that. And I was like, if it's not instruments, if it's not dance, I'm going to do flagging. When you become a leader, you have to add on to that consistency and you have to make sure that everyone is on the same path to the goal that we're trying to accomplish. As a team, as a group, as a fly get, just make sure we know the song, make sure we know what we're wearing, make sure we know we have our makeup at the same point, our hair done, everyone is okay, everyone knows the count and everything like that. So flagging also gives you a scholarship as well just like dancing and playing an instrument you will also get scholarships as well so it's exciting fun and it helps you to seek out opportunities for instance for C.R. Walker when I was at that school at the time the band was looking for a section leader they was looking for a flag it actually they didn't have any flags in the band so they was looking for a flag it and then one of my friends was saying, oh, Kusia in All Stars, she used to flag in. You should bring her so she could do it and teach us some stuff. So I was like, okay. I contacted one of my, um, the alumni, Lindy, and I let her know. And she was like, yeah, that's good. And you should go ahead. And I was like, okay. And I taught them some rules that All Stars taught me and the uh, alumni girls taught me and they were excited they learned a lot I, I disciplined them the way I was disciplined and they they liked it and I shared that knowledge with other people as well we, we, we come from a British military kind of style so that's all you really see you know you see the police band you see the defense force band you know everything is very very stoic and almost robotic even. You know, there's no harsh movements, there's no, the, the stateliness is actually in your uniform and how you present yourself. Um, the more serious you are, the more respect you gain. Things like that is, you know, just your presence alone um, in terms of, you know, you as an individual, what you exude in your uniform. Those are the things that made you a good uh, drum major and, and also the respect that you got from the band to be able to give commands and on on command get those commands to happen immediately you know um, but with show style margin to, to be honest the first time that I was really really introduced to that was when uh, our 12th grade went to the movies to watch drumline 
I was enamored by the way um, everything about about show style band, the way they, they, they got the crowd, um, the way they um, how they performed, the, the high the high knee style marching, you know, and so and so to watch that and even to watch um, how they you know how to go through a process to get into the band. All of that was new. That was something that I had never experienced, you know, because in, you know, here, yeah, especially with my church band, you, you be in the, in the band from your four, and there's a band for every age bracket until you die, you know? So <laughs> there's no, there's no real, you know, initiation per se, you know? And so seeing all of that, um, really, I really did not know how to transition into that. And I think Kenny had a hard time just trying to get us ready just for the homecoming because if I'm not mistaken, that band, uh, the, the, the initial band started in August and that trip is in, in October. So he really only had two months. But I can tell you exactly the moment when the transition was made in terms of us be moving from, from um, understanding the, the British and moving into the into the American style, the show style. On that same trip, when we went to Orlando, everybody know I don't like to lose, but I can tell you, they had this band in name, uh, Lake Ram Regiment. I think that's what their name is. They had three drum majors. Oh, and those drum majors, that whole band line up right in front of us, man, we was there now, uh, and Georgia Print, you know, and. <laughs> Like thinking back on it, I, I mean, I'm so sorry. I'm not, I'm not saying that our behavior in Brent is clowny, right? But we, we was looking clowny in the middle of all, you know, because everybody got on their either sweats or their serious uniform, you know? And the, that, that, those drum majors, they lined up right in the front of us. And I mean, when they tell you they cut our head off, I could feel my head on the ground. I know that they made us look so stupid and we was there with our, you know, our little moves, our little British things and, you know, and see, there wasn't even no space where we could have spent mace because that was our strong point. If we could have spent mace, any of you would have marched them up a little bit, you know? But there wasn't no space for that. So um, we had to stay there and take it. And I remember after that particular, the BCU homecoming parade, um, I think at some point during that time, we had learned that we were going to we were gonna maybe um, be a part of the Florida Classics the next year. And it was war after that. You know, I, I, I was telling Mark, Matthew and Lefty is like, listen, we, I will never have that feeling again. Ain't no one gonna cut my head off like that no more. I only, I only, I have a rule, you can beat me one time. But that's it. After that, you, you'll never beat me again. And so the goal, so transitioning, really getting, getting our head tear off, like I say, at that time, was what really made the transition much easier because we knew we knew we had to work harder. We had already seen it. We had never seen it before other than the movies on drumline, but we saw it for ourselves. And so just trying to just really harness that style, we had to work to get that. And so it was not easy, it was very difficult. And um, we had to change everything. And the only person who I could really say really helped us to get there was Kenny. You want me to look stupid? And tell us straight up and plain, y'all look stupid in much more words than that. You know, I know Kenny go. <laughs> you know, and, and, and he really got us to believe. And I think after that first uh, Florida Classic, um, we didn't lose that time. I think from then on, we may have set the bar for what drum majors are supposed to do in terms of entrance um, and even just presence among a band. You know, I attended Government High, but actually before that, I was in a band called Urban Renewal Band, Farm Road. That's when Farm Road was Farm Road. And I started off playing the clarinet there, and for some reason, I just switched to the saxophone since I was 13 years old. But the saxophone to me, I feel like the saxophone is the sole instrument. You know, it's the most sexiest instrument in the band. And so it has that, you know, sultry, torn quality. That is what I gravitated towards. All Star basically paved the way for me to be where I'm at now because if it wasn't for All Star, I would not have probably been in close proximity with Mr. Wells. I wasn't gonna probably been, you know, um, Bethune Cookman University because it was through All Star where I actually 
had the opportunity to audition for scholarships. In 2013 was when we actually had the, um, I think it was a summer concert, which was where Mr. Wells, he came over and he was able to audition some of the persons in the band. And that point where I actually received a scholarship to go away for, you know, that fall semester. Well, at the time I was actually in COB, majoring in um, biochemistry. And so I've always been fascinated by BCU only because of the band. But when the opportunity presented to me, I was, you know, I was even more, you know, happy because I remember, I think it was the first time when I went away, of course, with you know, the, the band that I told you about, that I was a part of. Um, I remember signing up in the admissions office. And when, um, I, I didn't even realize that I actually got accepted at that time. And so when Mr. Wells actually came over and he auditioned me, in my mind, I thought that I wasn't, you know, I wasn't ready. And I remember Mr. J saying to me, you know, um, you should try this. You should, you should, you should, um, you should play this. So I remember practicing Cecilia and Allegro. It was a, Cecilia was a short, it was a slow um, piece and Allegro was a much upbeat piece. And so I remember playing it in the front of Mr. Wells. And when he told me that I got the scholarship, I, I couldn't believe it. But at the time, I was also grateful. And so when I um, called the admissions office, Miss Debbie Dion, she said, well, Rikisha, she said, you didn't, you didn't know that you already had your, we already had your, um, your ID number here. And I said, Miss Dion, you serious? So she said, yeah. I was like, oh my God, this worked out great. That was a happy moment for me because I, was able to use my musical talent to get a scholarship, to be in the band that I wanted to be in, but to also pursue um, my college degree, which was biochemistry at the time. See, I remember my first year, freshman year, the first day of freshman camp, uh, it was me, it was me, my brother Nash, and Serrano, and even though we was excited to, you know, be a part of Potunga University, University Macho Wildcats, and that first day of band camp, I always remember this day. That day was the day I really got a reality check. Now we know back inside the Bahamas, we had different times. We call, had something called behaving time, which means that we ain't gonna be there early, but we can make sure we're there at the exact time. And the first day of freshman camp, I decided to do that same thing. We had to report 7.30. I say, you know what, I woke up about six o'clock that morning. I was already ready before 7.30. I was ready like by seven o'clock. And my barn, the barn room was like about two, a two minute walk away from my dorm. So I was like, you know what, I could take my time. I could really rush. I could be exactly there at 7.30. Lo and behold, I walked. I didn't see nobody at 7.30. It's like, I must see too early. Can't be, you nobody outside. And when I bind the corner, I see everybody's outside. And I was like, oh man. And that's when the drum major approached me. I can't repeat the things he said to me. And that gave me a reality check. And I was also out of uniform too. We were supposed to wear a certain uniform. We were supposed to wear a white, a white tee, clean white tee, round neck. I had on a V-neck. I had on my chain on. Uh, what else I had on? I think I had on the wrong color shoe. All type of things I had wrong. Cause I wanted to swag out on my first, my first day, you know? And then coming from the Bohemian background and, and going to American culture, it was something totally different, something I had to adapt to. So the things that All Star prepared me for is, and and uh, it's just being being on time, being on time. When we was preparing for the Bethlehem University Homecoming Parade and the Florida classes, we was always on time. We was there a whole hours and two hours ahead of time. And that same thing transferred into BCU, being under Dr. Wells' um, directorship. We was at stadiums two hours in advance before the, the game even began. And it's just all about preparedness and just having everybody, making sure everybody has on the right uniform, make sure everybody has everything, there's nothing missing. So All Star really, really prepared me for that. And it's very, very exciting and an eye-opener 
um, transitioning over those two years. Because in 2011, I played in an All-Stars uniform in the Armory Center, performing for the uh, Florida classes. And the very next year, to be inside of the Bethune Cooper University um, uniform, performing for the same crowd and also performing for some of the members or the organization I just left a year ago. It was very, um, very, very exciting, very amazing to, to represent my country. I, uh, Mr. J might give you a break, but when it comes to Dr. Wells, it ain't no break. If he, he knows what he wants and he get into that, before that practice time in. So that was the, the big difference, but there's a lot of similarities that um, both Bond staff had. You are the, you are the director, you know, who you can go to and clown on and have some jokes. Then you have your, your serious director, you know, you really can clown around too much. And he just about business, so you have all those, you have all those similarities. Well, one thing I took from Mr. J and Gerard and even uh, Brother Brian and the rest of the director staff from All Star, and even from some professors that I met in BCU along with the band staff at BCU, is like you have, you just have to be the best person you can be at all times. Always being prepared, always knowing what you want, and striving for that. And that's what I learned from all those people I um, encountered with. You have to always be the best you. You don't want to ever give someone a bad a representation of you. At all times, you have to be 100%. You have to get it. There may be some hiccups, there might be some bumps in the road, but you have to be your best at all times. So that's, that's one thing that has prepared me to now. Being prepared, being dedicated, um, being on time, Definitely not be it on time and just being the best I can be at all times. I guess over the last decade, I might have had probably 40 students from the, from, uh, from the Bahamas and the island of uh, Eleuthera as well uh, to come and participate in our, in our program. And the biggest thing that I've noticed about the Bahamian students is that, and, and I'm not uh, the American students, the students that we have from Florida and Georgia and all those places, they are great as well. I'm appreciative of every student that we have. But one thing that I've noticed about the Bahamian students is that they are appreciative. They are grateful for the opportunity. Uh, these, these are young people that when they come over over here, they don't walk in with a with a with a with an attitude or, or with a position that I'm great or anything like that. They walk in humble and they are they are appreciative of the opportunity. And they're very teachable. They're very teachable. And um, we've had uh, we've had students in all the positions in our band. We haven't had them at drum major, but we've had them in a lot of positions in the band. Um, and in I think in just about every section. And um uh, the biggest thing that we've had quite a few Bahamian students in our top win ensemble, our symphonic band, and uh, that's not easy to get into. Uh, we've had them uh, on woodwind, brass, and percussion in our in our, in our top band, uh, and like Walden, Walden, Narok, Walden, Narok, uh, uh, the uh, Anitio, and. Uh, What's the other one? Played bass, clarinet, and tenor. Evans. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and a couple. Evan Hanna. Evan Hanna. Evan Hanna. Yeah, Evan Hanna. Yeah. 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 And and then though, and, you know, and then uh, I'm proud of those guys because now uh, quite a few of them are over here working. A couple of them are band directors, but they, you know, after they finish over here, they decide to stay over here. They're working over here. A couple of them are married with families now, you know. So. Uh, uh, it, it makes any band director feel good when we get kids to come in and they go through the program, they get their education, they come out and they can go out into the job market, compete, get a job, and then start living a quality life. So uh, uh, I, I'm very appreciative uh, of the students and of you all, man, because uh, it, it has opened a, a, a connection or, or a pipeline, if you will, for Bethune Cookman for their students to come over here so every single day we had band from like about five to about nine o'clock but like when it came down to the um performance against 
farm you which was the florida classic we used to go over time so like about five o'clock that's when we used to have sectionals so we used to have sectionals every single day five to six and then six o'clock we used to have to go into the band room and that's when we start warm up as a band i mean and as with the whole band and then we run through songs we run through our stand music we run through what we're gonna play on the field and then mr wells would come in and he would run through the songs again and he will tell us okay y'all go outside so we'll go outside and about like about seven o'clock seven to nine or to 9 30 is where we would actually practice our formations and our dance routine on the field it it was manageable i used to just you know like everybody else go to school throughout the day um i used to do my homework throughout the day like where every time when i get like a break i used to do my homework i used to practice for like about an hour and then practice on my own for about an hour and then um you know just go and you know do my homework and study and then go back and meet for band so that's how my routine was every single day when i used to come home <laughs> i used to come home dog tired 10 o'clock in the night and you know i had a roommate Rikia and I also had my you know my band people and they used to come over sometimes and they used to say Keisha I can't you're not going to the party you know I mean and once in a while if they having something I would go but for me it was always studying so whatever time I had I had to study away from band and that's how I was able to manage well after leaving all stars I, I can't mention any of those other stuff if I don't mention my union with my wife Paige, because that would have been the first thing. You know, Mr. J already made mention of how the All-Star Band performed at my wedding reception. We had a parade from the Western Esplanade to the Hilton. Um, that was crazy, man. I, that, that was amazing. Um, and from that, um, Rhythm and Youth was born. My wife and I, we did a summer camp, a rake and scrape summer camp. And we realized that it was something special and something that had to continue, you know, even year round. That's how Rhythm and Youth was actually born. It's just a summer camp. The folks in the summer camp was like, man, let's continue this. And from there it was history. Um, Rhythm and Youth, um, along with JR Cash Primary School, we went on to travel to New York three weeks before the All Stars went to New York for the for the Macy's Day Parade. I just mad that they get the snow, man. We get the cold, but we ain't got no snow. You know, but anyway, that's all right. It ain't cool. Um, so we performed at the United Nations headquarters. We performed at Vassar College in Poughkeepsie, New York. Um, several other places we play. I don't know why I don't remember. <laughs> but those were the two main ones. Um, and we made history made us read. We did a, a, a halftime show for ACC Women's Championship Basketball. That was, that was big. We performed at the Children's Festival um, in Norfolk, Virginia. And I mean, so many other performances. Played in Washington on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, all that stuff. Um, and we made some history. Of course, COVID came and kind of knocked that a little bit out of, out of whack. We're just now trying to regenerate and start something again. Um, but I can safely say that if we never play ever again, the amount of young people that we have touched in Rhythm and Youth um, is phenomenal. We, I, I would have run my leg at a race if we, if we could say that. I ain't saying we finish, but I'm saying that if, if it were to be so, the amount of history that we have made I think we've done a fantastic job. I had a lot of um, older folks that I looked up to that went to government high and they spoke of this uh, band director called Mr. Justinian. I was like, who's this band director called Mr. Justinian? So I was like, okay, cool, cool, cool. Went to government high, transitioning to government high. Um, when I went there, 
still wasn't a part of All Stars as yet. But through the teaching and through the standard that Mr. J held when I went to Government High in grade 10, it sparked my interest in furthering myself in this great barn at the time. This bar was performing left, right, and center. This bar was traveling. This bar went to, to Baton. This bar went to, the, to, the, to, to, to this. They played to this. I was like, as an up and coming uh, musician, maybe this is the place that I need to be. Some kids on this, on this rock have never been exposed. You understand that it take organizations as such to expose them to certain things. You understand? Because if it wasn't for that experience, my personal experience, going over and actually seeing the bonds, actually seeing how they operate, actually seeing the discipline. So I can remember we warming up in the um, down low in the, um, the basement. And you could hear Fabio warming up with the EFAT Corral. I was like, whoo! So, you know, all the bars down there, they warm it up. I say, if all these bars could just be quiet and just let Fabio do their thing with that E flat warm up, I just went ahead and warm up. That would have been good. But it goes to show that as a nation, if we could, if we could provide more organizations as such as the All Star Barn, we could, um, you know, open the eyes of many other young persons to actually see, because it only takes a spark to what? Get a fire going. You understand? And it took that spark for me traveling abroad to seeing what it is that's going on over there. You understand? Because if, 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 a, if a child don't see it, how would they know? They wouldn't know. They wouldn't have options. They would only know, hey, the beach. Kong Solid, Kong Fritter, you know what I mean? Junk Canoe, you know what I mean? They would only know that. But organizations as such, you understand? If, if we would just have a little more interaction with just taking us to the next side to just see, just see what is going on. And all of these interactions I had be prior to me going to school. Watch when we went to Washington at Howard University. No and behold, Howard University is the founding campus of my fraternity that I didn't even know I was gonna pledge. So when I went to Prairie View, I didn't know nothing but Prairie View. I actually took the offer to Prairie View on a leap of faith. You know, um, I just take it on a leap of faith because they were off. They were offering after my audition. They were offering the most uh, scholarship money in at the time all right so i was jumping on an offer that hey was providing more but lo and behold when i went there it was it was a vibe that hey we could we get a chance hey, to create our own legacy within this barn and i mean to create what we want to do um in the positive realm of contributing to this barn and when we went there I went, I went there in 2015, it was only four of us who went there, we met uh, Gandhi there and she was one of the persons who was responsible in, in uh, you know, getting us past the, the baton for us to uh, go to Prairie View. So when I went there, it was, it was a culture of hey, a rebuilding process. So we were a part of the rebuilding process and uh, shout out to Dr. Zachary. Um, he brought us in and, and believed in us to to help rebuild the barn. So when we got there, it was nothing but, you know, it was nothing but um, good success going in. Yes, sir. Our relationship with the Bahamas actually goes back to when I was an assistant at Norfolk. Right, that's right, that's right. Yes, that's uh, right, I forgot about that. So that was in 2009, 2010 when the uh, police force band came over to Norfolk for a clinic during the summer. And that was my introduction to the, the culture and to the musicianship. And it has flourished ever, ever since. And when I became the director of bands here, uh, as Prof Gordon just said, one of the things that, that I put on the table immediately is that we need to change the culture. Uh, and the only way you can, you can't change something by doing the same thing. So we had to find students who were not indoctrinated into certain things and aspects of the traditional show style bands that here in the United States. 
and that was the the catalyst for me traveling down to the Bahamas and bringing I think it's about 26 students now uh, and the, the most impressive thing about the Bahamian students they've held every leadership position in the band all the way up to assistant director uh, but that is not the most impressive thing here at Prairie View the most impressive thing is that they have a 95% graduation rate oh wow so an average student in the Bahamas becomes an excellent student at Prairie View which is amazing because this is this is a technology school it is heavily laden in technology and STEM. But their work ethic, uh, their prowess on their instruments, as well as their commitment to the program is unsurpassed by most of our students. And they grow, they actually help to influence the other students to do certain things. So that is our experience with the Bahamas. When I went to Prairie View and I did my research, I found out that it was about 50 plus choir students came um, over in 1970 on a yeah. choir, yeah, on like a choir scholarship. It's like 50 of them. And then I, from doing more research, I run into a few of them. Hey, we was here and we did this and they performed for Martin Luther King. And I was like, yeah, I've traveled to England travel all over the United States, travel all over the Bahamas. But I will say this, ain't no audience, ain't no views, ain't no, ain't nobody watching you as much as that uh, Macy's Day Parade. If I'm not mistaken, the views on that, on that parade alone was in the millions. I was people watching on the site, people watching on TV, People watching on YouTube, people watching on People's Live. That was one of the most proud I've ever been to represent my country. It was just a, a change of uh, scenery that to say, hey, we go on to the Big Apple, and we are going to represent the Bahamas in the front of millions of people. And I could sit here to say that I have experienced it twice. The second time I've experienced it is with the Prairie View and their marching storm. We too went to the Macy's Day Parade and it made me feel extra good when the directors called me in, uh, me and a few others who went. Uh, it was me, Samiko, and Jabari. Yeah. They called us in and said, hey, Tell us about your experience at the Macy's Day Parade. Tell us what they expect. Tell us what y'all feel. So we felt like celebrities, like, yeah, we already did this. You know, um, the Macy's Day Parade is a very big deal. And I honestly didn't notice the big deal until I went to college. When they say, when they said the Prairie View is going to the Macy's Day Parade, I'm talking to people upstairs at school, the alumni, the, the community, Houston, everybody was going crazy. It is such a big deal that everybody was just going insane. You're walking on campus to class and say, oh, y'all go to the Macy's State Parade. Y'all take y'all this, y'all take y'all that. But you know what I mean? So it, it, it is a big deal that I got to experience it firsthand within this organization and get to carry my experience over to my university, shed light on, you know, what took place, what happened, how we did it, and the overall outlook of our overall experience at the Macy State Program. What I need to, to congratulate this organization on is surviving. And I think that you will realize that a lot of things start and after a couple of years fizzle out. I think that the personal commitment and sacrifices that the directors have made have been responsible for the success of this program. And I think the biggest success that you see as directors from the organization is the successes made in the growth of what were children, now into young adults, and good contributing members of society. 
I would only want to say that I expect you to be a household name. Just like how we are Boy Scout, Girl Scouts, uh, you know, th these are long, well-established organization. There's very little that we are seeing that are helping us to, to get our children into worthwhile organizations. We don't have much opportunities for them to embark on activities. I mean, COVID has killed a lot. You know, anything that required physical interaction um, is just on a hold right now for the past year, including the band. You know, you, you can give out instructions, but they have to come together at some point in time. And I'm hopeful that the COVID situation will fizzle out to the point where we can start doing that again. I am prayerful that you will still be around, not just for 10 years, but for much longer, because what I think that as directors you will do is to look and make sure that you have a succession plan that your journey didn't start with a five-year plan your journey must have been we are carrying this to the end and I think that you've done a wonderful job um, you might not get the, the the applause and the accolades that you deserve rightfully and definitely I know that the journey did not come with a lot of um, funds coming in to the organization. I'm sure that there's been a lot of personal sacrifices on your part, but I'm hopeful that there will be funding. And I think some of the funding should start at the governmental level because they need to recognize that this organization actually saved a lot of youth, right? So that's the first thing. And then for parents and the wider community to pushing some money into this to allow you to be able to travel even further into the international scene. And, you know, just like how they would say, the athletes will spread the word that the Bahamas, little Bahamas exist and, and win the gold medals, that you will also make that mark, but as a marching band. And, um, you know, and they'll say, who is that? Bahamas. And you know, that is how people start asking, so where's the Bahamas, you know? And if they can develop that level of talent in a country with a small population, it must mean that there is a lot of good here. And there is a lot of good here.
Ladies and gentlemen, stand to your feet and give a rounding round of applause to these young musicians called the Bahamas All-Stars. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've reached to the end of our program for tonight. We want to thank you for coming out. I know it was sweet, but we'll see you next year. Good night.